I auditioned and ended up getting in by some miracle. I'm not really sure what happened. Why don't we just strike while the iron is hot? Why don't we make it COVID, make it during COVID, and then just get it out as soon as possible. Once that was brought up, it was a little bit of a sudden like, all right, can we pull this off? Was there anything like that for you or a moment where you're like, this is this is the thing that I'm connecting with? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to get emotional. I'm sorry. <laughs> Soro Films is a production company that supports emerging storytellers with all aspects of independent filmmaking. On this podcast, we interview filmmakers about their practical wisdom and experience in an effort to demystify the industry. Today, we interview Stephen Meek, co-director of Recovery and co-founder of the comedy network JK Studios. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> uh, what other interviews have you have you done? Um, Were they with... It was all you, Mallory Whitney. Yeah, yeah. We were all slated together to do a number of Zoom calls with mm -hmm. people, um, all covering South by Southwest. So Shakya and some Austin-based one, Lights, Camera, Austin. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there were, I don't really remember the, yeah. all the names, but yeah. everyone we talked to was, was so nice. Yeah. Like they were the sweetest people we've ever met and they were all like you guys made a fun movie and we're like thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah how's that i mean it's been a couple weeks hasn't it since it premiered mm -hmm. how are you guys feeling good it was just like yeah we weren't anticipating our our pr company um told us to anticipate like mixed positive kind of mm -hmm. thing um just because they thought that from the the screener links that they had sent out to people that they were thinking most people would land kind of on like the um, mixed, yeah, just mixed positive area. But yeah, for the most part, it just felt like it was all positive. So it was like, mm. um, it was just really, really nice to Good. to get that energy. Yeah, back totally. Yeah, for, after yeah, well, and especially you know, from a pandemic coming from a pandemic, I'm right. sure it's nice to have that. The, I a lot of this um our audiences are really interested in like the the details of filmmaking, mm -hmm. you know, and like the yeah. process of it. And I don't think I've ever heard of what was it, a test screener link that a PR company sends out. Oh, so like our um yeah, just the the film in its completed version, they just sent it They'll out. Send yeah. It out to as a screener to different media outlets to just kind of get like the whether or not there would be positive reactions to it gotcha. kind of thing. So it was, I mean, all of the lingo they used was new to me too because it was yeah. like <laughs> curtain raisers and toe dips and I don't know. It's yeah. just like sending the movie to people, seeing if there were anyone who kind of would champion it and and mm -hmm. enjoy it. And mm -hmm. there ended up being a, a lot of people that really seemed to connect with it. The The caveat has always been you made a pandemic movie that was still funny so like i don't know how to explain that <laughs> like like the the we made a movie and even though people have low expectations for it i guess it's the feeling <laughs> like even though we're not expecting anything you did a great job kind of kind of feeling so <laughs> it's been interesting yeah hmm. yeah that um when we were talking when whitney and mallory were talking about you know this is your first feature film right mm -hmm. that you've direct written and directed um and i imagine this this process has been the putting it into film festivals and going mm -hmm. through all of that has been new Very for you new. guys yeah what no. what's it been like navigating that um i mean honestly we wouldn't i don't know if we would have been able to navigate it very well without soro mm -hmm. so much like we we zero experience we were just like okay filmfreeway.com lets you submit to <laughs> yeah <laughs> all of these film festivals yeah uh let's just send it out there mm -hmm. um south by southwest doesn't actually use film freeway so we were like well we know we really want to go to that one we know that we want to go there's some maybe more international ones that we should try for mm -hmm. um but it was very much a feeling of like as soon as we were accepted to south by southwest that's when um scott and abby and everyone like just was like okay now we're gonna get this lined up do. get a pr company and and um 
the fact that I think the biggest boost to us was that um, South by Southwest introduced or or um, I don't even know what to call it. It was like a like teaser, the like the yeah, the top eight to at watch the for or something. Not even like list. not not like a watch list, but like a um, they just when they announced the films that were going to be at their festival before they announced the slew of um, the other 70 plus films that they were doing mm. they we were in a, a kind of a teaser list mm. gotcha. so the there were eight films mentioned there and I think that was made made the biggest difference was mm. um, people reaching out to us right away because they were like oh so you're you're like an early um, mention from South by Southwest. So um, PR um, sales team um, all kind of came out of the fact that we were just mentioned in hmm. what felt like a little bit of an exclusive list. Really? So, yeah. so your PR team reached out to you after that? I, th- I think or Scott, were, or I they... think um, Soros used um, PMK before okay. in other festivals and just loved working with them so much. So cool. it was like, we need these people now. But I think that's really helpful for newer filmmakers to hear, mm-hmm. you know, that there's there's people out there or, or organizations that do that specifically right. can help you with it. Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, I want to back up a little bit because I, yeah. I feel like um, you didn't start in film at mm-hmm. all, right? Nope. You, you're, tell us a little bit about your beginnings in, in acting in and acting. in film. Well, I mean, I guess just in this industry, right? Because mm-hmm. you originally started out in as an international relations major. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. What, what's that? <laughs> How did Yeah, A to B, we you want to connect it for us. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I was still a boy, my older brother went to Brigham Young University and he brought home a um, Divine Comedy DVD at mm-hmm. some point. Okay. Um, and Divine Comedy, the, the sketch um, group at BYU. Um, he brought that DVD home, and I was just, like, so enamored. I was like, this just looks like so much fun. Um, I got to – I ended up going to BYU as well, and it wasn't really, like, on my radar. I, mm-hmm. I enjoyed doing the school plays and the school musicals and stuff. I don't have a good singing voice, though, so I was never, like, a – big part of the musicals I was just kind of like part of the chorus having fun um I never really did any of the big um high school um acting roles or anything like that so um I came to BYU and as much as I had enjoyed acting there wasn't any like sense of I didn't have the confidence in thinking that I was gonna actually study acting or or anything related to it whatsoever um and then I, there was a friend of mine that I had met freshman year who, um, Jenny Gray, she's now married to Jason Gray, who is a part of Divine Comedy. Um, and she, I remember her writing me a letter at some point when I was in um, Korea for my two-year service mission. Um, so she wrote me a letter. I was like, um, Jason's in this group. That's really, really fun. And I think you'd be a good, um, fit for it if you were interested. And I got back from Korea and I, I like missed the audition. So I didn't even get to do it that first year I was back. But, um, the next year I auditioned because I was like, oh, this is a group of people that is, it's not really about like the acting so much. It's, it's Mm -hmm. very much about like the, the, um, group dynamic and the the energy and the mm-hmm. audience and making sure that it's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't have to be a good singer. I didn't feel like I needed to be a good actor. <laughs> Things like that. I don't. I don't. I hope that's not insulting to anybody. But it was just like a oh this this might be a good fit because it's just like a group of people that are very fun. Yeah. Um, and so I auditioned and ended up getting in by some miracle. I'm not really sure what happened um but um from that point forward it was very like um it was just a a school of hard knocks I felt like you were you were trying to come up with so much material every semester for um crowds of people hoping that you'd sell out the auditoriums that we were trying to uh, perform in um 
And yeah, that was really where I started like cutting my teeth on comedy writing um, and comedy acting, I guess, kind of stage act- acting and um, everything like that. And so I got in the summer before um, Studio C, the BYU TV show, started. So it was like a kind of slipping in the door as it was closing kind of thing. <laughs> um, and and so it just became a very intensive kind of process. Like the the 10 of us that were in Studio C were, mm-hmm. became very tight knit because we were just always trying to write, always trying to experiment with new things, throwing everything you can up against the wall and seeing if it sticks. Um, and that gave us the confidence. I mean, six years af- after six years of doing Studio C, we all were like, I think that we want to try to do something new. Um, I think that we've hit the limit of the opportunities and the and the kind of experience that we've got here. So we left en masse and started JK Studios. And that was very much, it was another season of like intensive um, guerrilla type work, I guess, of of learning how to do Every job yeah. that we hadn't already learned in terms of, I mean, editing and production and um, every one of those pieces. We we made a number of web series. We we had people who were um, willing to part with their money to <laughs> see if, <laughs> if we could make something good out of it. Yeah. Um, so we made some very fun shows. We made the first season of Freelancers and we're very excited to make the second one coming up. Um, but all of those things were really just like developing the talents that we didn't even know we half the talents weren't ones that we even really like wanted to develop I guess but it was like a somebody needs to and we need the necessity of people um learning how to edit and and Mm -hmm. learning all of the just every step from from a concept all the way to the um actual release of a of a product so we so JK Studios became, yeah, that new um crucible, I guess. And we and we so I'm I'm very um I think that recovery would have been impossible if we hadn't had like that kind of Studio C gave us the writing chops, JK Studios gave us the production chops, and then and then we were able to put it all together to make a feature in the middle of 2020. Yeah. The great pandemic of 2020. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, re, so you never really like saw yourself writing comedy. You you just kind of got thrown into it with Divine Comedy. Yeah. Yeah. What, was that, what was that like trying to pick up those skills and, and just write comedy if you'd never done it before? You know, this taking on these new skills mm-hmm. in such a guerrilla fashion, you know, I yeah. feel like that kind of has to happen at the beginning of a filmmaking career. and. And then it starts, there's almost like this pressure to specialize. Right. Which you've managed to not really have to specialize yet, right? Like you've you've been able to, you've just directed something, mm-hmm. but you do spend a lot of your time writing, correct? And acting. Right, yeah. So what's, I mean, are you drawn to one more versus the other? Yeah, I think that, I mean, there have been plenty of, dark moments when it's been that feeling of like should we focus on something very specific should we just go full bore into one like idea should i become a producer only should i become an editor only like those feelings of like i don't know if we can keep up this pace that we (laughs) we already have right now um so would it be wiser to try to like get very very good at one thing instead of spreading ourselves too thin but at the same time I feel like um knowledge in all the different categories of making film or writing um comedy or drama is are just there's so many invaluable lessons from literally everywhere um so many shining examples of people who are are doing um all of the aspects like I think of like David Bowie for some reason and like the fact that he did like so much um theater but then so much um music as well and and art and there's just people who are are incredibly good in so many areas and I think it's because they are trying to expand themselves they're trying to trying to create um situations that are pushing them to another level 
Um, and so the more I think about all of the, the, um, like evidences that want to push me towards specializing in something, I'm more inclined to be like, but there's so many things, there's so many experiences that you can do. Mm. And, and, um, honestly just taking, picking up the one that feels most exciting and most, um, fulfilling or most expanding at any given moment feels like the path that I personally at least want to keep trying to do. Yeah. Um, so directing has become a definitely something that I have really, really enjoyed. Um, I only ever really directed a few sketches while on Studio C. Um, and then a few of our JK Studios productions. Um, so directing a um, feature for the first time was a very, yeah, just a very new experience, a very exciting kind of like, how is this going to work? Mm -hmm. How to, is it really just like, the small version, like the six hour directorial experience from before, but just extended over the course of three weeks. Is it basically the same? Um, and I think it actually is kind of basically the same. It's like, it's like you, you still have to hold all of the continuity in your head of like, oh, this scene needs to match this and the energy needs to be at this point um, here, here and here. Um, but in terms of directing and and writing and acting there there's so many um opportunities there's so many there, there's just like so many different directions you can go at any given time mm. um so it feels just exciting to do the ones that are presenting themselves at the moment yeah i'm i'm curious to know this is actually one of our audience questions mm. um was how did you prepare to direct this thing what like what's your process for preparing to direct yeah um so i have a pen from korea that i've labeled my bong joon ho pen so that i can be i can channel all of the directorial spirits that i this was the first time i ever did this it became a little totem of mine that i kept on set all the time because i was like all right i've got this pen and i've got this script and you just make everything else up as you're going along kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I'm not even sure I'm answering the same question that you asked. No, but, yeah. But. So you you guys went, you, were, you weren't brought on until after they had finished yeah. writing. Like I was definitely aware that they were like preparing the script. And at first it was very much like, a, we're going to just make the script for, um, you know, just because we're not doing anything else right now. We're just going to write something that maybe we'll be able to film it a few years from now, maybe we'll figure out funding to do it later. And then there was a point where they struck on the fact that if we made it COVID specific, then it, we would want to make it much sooner mm. than now. And there was a little bit of a feeling of, should we go with this kind of COVID gambit? Like, is it, is it really gonna, are people going to want to watch anything in COVID or, or, um, but are we also like on the on the front line of of um, a slew of movies that are going to be pandemic related? Right. Um, so it was very much a feeling of why don't we just strike while the iron is hot? Why don't we make it COVID, make it during COVID, and then just get it out as soon as possible? Um, and so it was sometime in July when. How was that? I think it was in July when we were looking forward and like, oh, the first um, festival date that we would want to submit to would be October 2nd. Um, that was the late feature deadline for Sundance. And so we're like, if we set ourselves that objective, do you think that we can make it kind of thing? <laughs> and And from that point forward, it was just a little bit like, Let's just do it and not think about it. Yeah. <laughs> and then, I mean, we made a pact early on that was like, if if we're ruining this film, if we're ruining ourselves, like let's just let's just call it. But from that decision forward, it was a very like, we've got all these lessons that we've learned, we've got all these skills that we've been developing for so long. Like, this is the moment to like put them to the test. Hmm. You know? How much of those conversations about going from 
we'll just write this script for a future date to, mm -hmm. you know, rubber meets the road. Were you, how much a part of those conversations were you, I know, I mean, obviously Whitney and Mallory were talking mm -hmm. about that as they were writing this, but you're there with Whitney mm -hmm. and I'm sure she's talking to you about yeah. it. I wasn't really um, keyed in until they brought up like the, the Sundance deadline. Mm. Um, once that was brought up, it was a little bit of a sudden like, all right, can we pull this off? We have to. We have to hit this deadline for writing. We have to hit this deadline for pre-production. Mm. We have to hit this deadline for filming. We need to give ourselves at least a month to edit the whole thing together um, and get at least like a few screenings to our friends and, and family and such so that we can hopefully submit a working cut to Sundance. Um, so yeah, I guess I was clued in by the time they were like writing the script in earnest. Gotcha. Yeah. You mentioned that this story is, it's very much Whitney and Mallory's, like they've put themselves into it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's really interesting. I think nowadays there's, there's a lot of talk about like, what is Directing a story that's not necessarily your own, I guess that's always been the case, right? Like mm -hmm. you've had to find something in the story that you can connect with that that then you can draw on as you're directing. Right, right. What was there anything like that for you or a moment where you're like, this is this is the thing that I'm connecting with? Mm -hmm. Um I think that it honestly all started out in more of a feeling of um I I like they can't do it alone. Mm. Like they, they need the extra hands. Gotcha. <laughs> and, I, yeah. and I happen to be here and I happen to be free and like both time wise and money wise, I'm free to do this kind of thing. <laughs> um, and so there was that initial element of just like, oh, this is more out of necessity than out of like a um, true um, calling or connection to the project. Right. Um, as soon as we were in the um, rehearsing and the rehearsing phase, though, it was much more of a feeling of like, oh, I might actually be even outside of if all other things had been more in our control in terms of like um, funding or or just time, um, all of it. Like I might still be the right fit for this because I've seen these two act for so long. Um, we we can get on the same page with each other very very quickly when it comes mm. to a creative vision for something um we we kind of have developed our shorthand in terms of of um just communicating this kind of idea to each other and 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 just yeah getting on the same page very very easily um so it, it quickly became a feeling of like oh this fits so well because i know how they work, I know how they act. I know when they're forcing things. I know when when the the emotion is maybe in the wrong place. Um and and I can actually just be a kind of a, a voice to chime in and, and be like, all right, let's just like slow down and and you guys know exactly what you're doing and you're just you're doing it so well. So let's just keep trying to get the as much out of this emotion and out of this scene as possible because we we all know what we're trying to get Confident. at the end of the day yeah 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 what what was that like co-directing mm -hmm. with Mallory yeah um our co-directing um experience was very much a I would usually come up with a shot list because I didn't I'm not even positive to this day, like who is supposed to be in charge of a shot list? Like, is that an AD thing? Is that like, is that, I have no idea who's supposed to do that. Job. I think it's, a, I think it depends on the production. Yeah. Okay. On our Especially in independent film. Yes, yes. Um, so I would come up with a shot list to cover any given scene that we were doing. Um, Mallory and I would then basically go looking for the location Often the night before we were supposed to film a scene <laughs> and then just park and talk about what we what we needed to do, how we wanted to cover it, um, what what ideas we thought worked, what what didn't really like 
um, clarify and, and connect everything together. Um, in our experience, comedy is very much about coverage and and um, and like the natural kind of um, interactions that you have with mm -hmm. with whoever you're in a scene with. Um, trying to actually like hear what they say instead of knowing what they say beforehand. Yeah. Um, and so our our approach was very much just like we need to be able to have long takes. We need to be able to um, get multiple angles of things because we're gonna we're not really sure how it's all gonna cut together. <laughs> um, and so the the co-directing was very much it felt very much a uh, kind of like a technical um, covering of the whole film. And then when the camera was on, um, it became more of the the keeping the energy um, natural. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, at one point, you all three of you were on screen together, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. what, how did that go? That day we had our unit director come in and, <laughs> and do a bunch of things. Um, Mallory, like we weren't typically on camera at the exact same time. Um, so Mallory and, and our unit director, Lane, would direct me when the camera gotcha. was on me and yeah, then yeah. and then when we'd flip around it was lane and i um working on mallory and whitney um yeah so that was that was yeah a third person that we brought in to <laughs> that's <laughs> help us i think that that's another um question because you guys it sounds like you 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 kind of were all involved in the whole even like the producing process you mm -hmm. know the very the logistics of it yeah um and in raising funding um Mallory and Whitney talked about this a little bit last time but what what was your process for raising funding what did like what how did that happen <laughs> yeah you know once you guys decided we're gonna do this this mm -hmm. summer yeah where'd you go from there it genuinely we started it out thinking all right we can get like 40 50k ourselves to try to do this like just just from our own personal like savings and everything we're just like wow. let's just like bet that we can make this movie with our own money between um, the three of you between the three of us wow um so okay. that was the initial plan yeah um i then we then talked to um I mean, our our Whitney is really good at Photoshop, so she made a pitch deck that we then were like offering to different people, and like you can give us like five k, and that'll be like that will go so far in this movie. Yeah, um, stuff like that. We were like we were reaching out to different people to to see who would be interested. So we had um, another friend of ours who was like, "Yeah, I'm I'm happy to give some money to the film." Um, my parents were like, "Sure." Why not? They keep telling me that they were like, we weren't expecting anything to come back to us or anything. We just wanted to be supportive. <laughs> That's very nice of you. Thank you. Um, so we had um, people like, so we had basically just micro investors that yeah. were all like trying to um, make this movie. Um, and then um, Babette Kelly as our um, production manager, our UPM, um, she was doing so much of the just like the actual production work in terms of seeing how we were going to make this budget how we were going to be able to pay yeah. everybody um because yeah. we definitely did not want to be just like full come do this movie for free for us as a favor and we'll defer payment and maybe you'll get something on the back end we really wanted to even if it wasn't like the most premium rate we wanted to make sure that everybody felt like they were um, being taken care of in our crew because um, that's always been the element that we're like hyper focused on that that we don't want people to ever feel um, abused by by our our efforts because it's all just kind of like it's all just vanity at the end of the day sometimes it's <laughs> the feeling of like we're just making a movie because we think we're funny enough to do so um, and <laughs> and so we just didn't want anybody to feel taken advantage of and um but Babetta Kelly knowing um, Scott Christopherson was like, 
a godsend because she was like, let's set up a meeting with him. He might be interested because you're making the movie either way. And um, if you if he wants to sign on, if Sora Films wants to sign on, then that will just alleviate everybody's stress. Mm -hmm. And so we were um, it was like our lunch break of the um, five days into shooting that we went to Scott's house and like pitched the movie to him. And he was like, yeah, all right, let's do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that sounds pretty anti <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was, it, it was very amazing. much like we, um, yeah, it was just it's the fun. fact that we were building the plane. It was taking off. Yeah. We were making it midair. And then somebody was like, guess yeah, what? Okay. I've got an engine for you. And we we're like, oh, thank you. Yeah. So um, yeah. we were we were planning on it being so truly indie, so truly just like out of our own pockets. And, right. and Soro Films in many ways kind of fell out of a blue sky to, to mm. pick the production up. Mm. Yeah. So what your crew members signed on thinking – this is a small mm -hmm. indie mm -hmm. film. <laughs> yeah. a, and then halfway through, or uh, yeah, halfway through production, right? Yeah. So you, you, two weeks of production. Right. You had the funding come in. We had the funding come in, yeah. Yeah. And we would have been able to pay everybody. We would have just been like, we probably wouldn't have been able to pay anybody for post. Would mm -hmm. would have ultimately been the, the problem. Um, so we wouldn't have been able to pay properly for sound mixing or vfx or mm. um color um and we weren't paying ourselves already for for like the editing and everything we we're like okay we can handle the editing but everything else after that we're a little bit like maybe people will be able to do it yeah. for nothing <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> but yeah. sorrow sorrow being able to um fund so much of the film ultimately made it feel like oh, okay we've got everybody covered it's not it's not yeah. like the the most expensive film by any means, but but yeah. they no. saved us. <laughs> yeah. That's uh yeah, being able to even think that far ahead, you know, to post when you're so in the trenches on mm -hmm. like getting mm -hmm. it made. I'm sure that was good knowing that that horizon was yeah was close and covered. Right, right. That's good. Um yeah, what so you guys ended up editing it, right? Yeah, yeah. So we were able to get um, our digital imaging technician to kind of put it all together in an organized way. And we had um, – so we had two assistant editors who were able to basically organize the whole film. Mm -hmm. And then Mallory took the first, like, 45 minutes, and I took the last 35 minutes. And we just were, like, over the course of – I guess we did it in, like, one week. We just were, like – Go 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 every day every night for until we had like the whole film completed. Mm. Um, but yeah, we it was basically our our editors did the um our assistant editors did the yeah the organizing and then we were able to dive into it mm. as seamlessly as you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it obviously it worked, right? You guys were able to. Against all the odds, to get it, it seems together. like it worked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's really exciting. It's a lot of work, mm -hmm. um, but also it's a lot of work and work-life balance. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, is is it even a thing? You know, like do you like how how yeah. did you guys manage that? I guess when when you're... when you're in when you're in it, it's a little bit of a feeling of like I can I can do this. For a short period of time. I know mm -hmm. I can do this. Yeah. Like thinking about it now, it's not something that you necessarily want to replicate. But if it came down to it, you know that you're capable of it. Like mm -hmm. I, I think back sometimes on like school and that feeling of like, how did I last minute write papers all the time? Like how did yeah. like if I try to do that now, I feel like I'd just be like, so exhausted and why did I ever do that to myself but you're capable of doing like anything it like you sacrifice sleep sometimes you 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 don't see you don't have a social life for a while but like you you're capable of anything like you can you can really work life balance I don't even know if that exists in the film world when you're on a project like yeah Literally everybody I know from from 
above the line, below the line, anybody on, on a film project is like, this is my life for, for hopefully just for like a month, hopefully for just like yeah four or five months. Right. Like you're, you're able to do it and then, and then you get to relax and unwind a little bit after it's all done. Hmm. So I think that's just what we relied on was that feeling of like, we can, we can manage this in the short term. And I think, I mean, there's probably a lot more progress we could still do in terms of divvying up roles. But when we're going into a filming project, we know like, okay, all right, well, there's so many things that we're going to take care of um, for the boys before, before it starts. And I'll handle um, meal prep and um, we'll hand, you'll handle the figure out the person who's going to be here on day X, Y, and Z. Um, so all of those, it feels fairly um, symbiotic right mm -hmm. now because we're, we're putting fair play into, into action. Nice. <laughs> nice. Oh, that's from, from the few people I've been able to talk to about this. Cause I think this is something that a lot of, you know, a lot of people think about, um, that it does come down to that, you know, like, teamwork yeah <laughs> essentially yeah. yeah that that brings up a a question that i had but also some of our audience members had yeah. is is what and in, not necessarily just recovery but just in your writing your comedy writing um and directing um are there outside influences you know beyond beyond comedians or films that have influenced your work you know does does your background in international relations play mm -hmm. any part mm -hmm. in in things you care to tell stories about hmm. i'm not keyed enough keyed in enough on the film world to feel like these directors are my like my people these are <laughs> these are the ones that i can like turn to and be like what would what would Paul Thomas Anderson do? And I don't necessarily feel that kind of like um, energy with anybody's work. I feel like, um, and maybe this is just still one foot in the sketch comedy world, but with sketch comedy, you can visit anywhere for like these brief snatches of time. So you've got one of the favorite sketches I ever did was um, playing a, Roman emperor kind of thing where we we were laughing at somebody who kept like missing swings from a from like a batting cage kind of situation um and and so like i i loved the energy of just being able to like shout the classic phrase bread and circuses and and having that um be applied to such a like mundane silly thing but it like allowed us to like we were all in like this really epic <laughs> roman garb and and um and um just a crowd of people shouting at this one person who can't hit a baseball um but like that feeling of of being able to step into a world or step into a character um gives you gives you just like a a little glimpse, a little um snatch of just just anything, whether it's the the period the the person um so having one foot in the sketch comedy world, I feel like nothing feels like off limits in terms of where you can go, what you can take influence from. Mm. We've done noir sketches. We've done very like Liam Neeson action film sketches. We've we've done just the whole gamut, and and yeah. so um, when it comes to stories that I want to actually tell, I feel like you can tell them through so many different forms, through so many different um, iterations. Whether it was like an actual like we're gonna go to ancient. Mesopotamia and yeah. Uh, yeah. um or or you're going to um go specifically into I'm trying to think of a good example there there's um 
the stories that I feel most attached to right now are honestly uh, more family oriented because I've got three little boys. They're they're like my twenty four seven um life and job, and mm-hmm. so the um seeing the things that they really are excited about, um, thinking about making things that they would be really excited about, telling stories mm-hmm. that are related to um, father-son dynamics, um, things like that are all very interesting to me um, mm-hmm. right now. And, and um, yeah, I don't, I, I guess I don't know what the next story is going to be, but I feel like it's going to partake of those elements of, of, of um, have it, trying to form close family bonds, trying to um, take care of people because anywhere in the whole slew of history, you've got people try, trying to take care of other people. And, um, and especially in a world that feels like it's disintegrating in so many different ways, like it, it um, trying to create some lightness and levity feels like it's what I've been able to do for so long. It's something that I feel very confident in, in being able to continue to do. And as much as I love There Will Be Blood, I probably am not going to make any There Will Be Blood films because it doesn't feel like it's it's um, in me, I guess. It's, mm-hmm. it's not um, my, my um, story or my message that I want to give out to people. Mm-hmm. How so? You were mentioning that they that they right now. That's kind of where you're drawing, I guess, in a cliche way to say it. Drawing your inspiration from mm. is your experience with with your sons. Um, is that is there something in in the works or that you would like to do mm-hmm. coming from that area of your life? Um, there are two very specific projects that. I like think about that I'm not even sure what the path to making them even looks like. Mm-hmm. One of them is actually a sci-fi film about cloning <laughs> that that would involve Oh, I'm going to get emotional. I'm sorry. <laughs> <sighs> it's not even a real story yet. I haven't even like read it or anything. But <laughs> I'm really sorry. No, it's okay. Maybe because I haven't really like talked about it with anybody before. Mm. So I haven't. It feels like, um. <laughs> yeah, really personal. I can't. I can't. I can't get it out. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Let me. Let me just like. <laughs> I'm laughing so much too. No, Just trying it's to good. like break the break out of the emotion for some reason. Um, um, the movie that I would be most interested in making is actually. I feel like you can't like cut from me like not crying to like something crying for no reason. Good. <laughs> Drow is an amazing Come editor. On, you're, you're He's really good. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just, 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 so good. Good. <laughs> just so good. Just so good. Anything happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do I look? I mean, do I look remotely composed right now? I don't. Look at me. Look at me. You look great. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> you're fine. Um, uh, a movie that I love watching with my boys, um, Paddington, mm. Paddington Two. Those connect so well to me because it it feels like I mean Paul King having directed The Mighty Boosh, which is a very sketchy kind of sitcom, um, I feel like would just be, that's like, he's already filling the niche that I want to fill. Like he, he's like making um, such wonderful comedic um, stories that are more family oriented um, with a beloved children's character. Um, so there's a there's a movie called Oh, what is it called? It's like the snowman. I think it's just very simply called the snowman. Okay. Have you seen this? It's like this British animated film that's like done in colored pencil from like forty years ago or something. Yeah. Yeah. I think I remember. It what has you're this amazing about. song in it that's like 
one of the best songs I've ever heard. Okay. Walking on the air. Um, walking in the air. Um, anyway, I was like, if we could make the snowman Paddington style, that would just be the best thing. <laughs> like that that's that's one of the projects that. that I really want to yeah, do. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds really wholesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really great. <laughs> um the other one is, yeah, sci-fi cloning a lost child. So mm. that that's as far as I can probably talk about it without getting too like worked up, I guess. Okay. But, yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll keep a watch out. For cool. Those. Who knows? Yeah. They, they, they are maybe like a decade down the line because I don't even know what the path looks like to get funding to make anything like either of these movies. I assume mm. the snowman and Paddington, any sort of like parallel would be like, I don't even know what the VFX budget for Paddington is. And right. how do you even like tackle that without a major studio behind it? It's yeah. just like the sci-fi one might, might be a little more more manageable so i'll let you know when the script that, is finished that, uh, yeah <laughs> who'd have thought a sci-fi would be more manageable than uh, right, right. <laughs> i guess it would be because it would yeah. be more in the line of like her or um i mean right deus ex had or ex machina ex machina had um more um definitely had a lot of vfx in it but yeah but that that energy that like small cast um futuristic world um kind of feel hmm. in the short term looking looking for the next few years where where do you see yourself and jk studios and uh headed where do you see your guys yourselves headed <sighs> i guess anywhere the wind takes us at this <laughs> point um freelancers season two is happening which we're all very very excited for we just loved making the first season um and and so it's great to revisit that we we were just having a conversation the other day about kind of comparing Fleabag season one and season two and how like they're the same world and the same character but they felt like such different um stories and different um same character at different phases in their lives mm -hmm. and so we were talking about like does the future of freelancers in particular need to actually be like forever this very kind of it's not slapstick it's it's just absurdist and um and um just kind of just off the wall very sketchy kind of sitcom and if it could ever transition into a more like um character driven um not a drama by any means, but like yeah. <laughs> character driven, um, um, very connective kind of kind of story rather than just like, what's another random thing that we could say now? <laughs> um, um, so I, I like the idea that freelancers could actually be a project that evolves and that has staying power because it's a it's a um, because it has good bones it has good like um versatility hmm. within it yeah um but outside of that it's a little bit like i mean you just keep you just keep writing and you keep dreaming yeah keep keep hoping for the next the next person to and i hopefully if you're just doing good work and treating people well that more opportunities will keep appearing yeah so yeah, maybe that's somewhere we can end is is asking how, you know, from your experience starting in Divine Comedy, you know, mm -hmm. now you you're part of this network that you've JK Studios that you've um helped found. What advice would you have for for filmmakers, especially like regional parts of the US, mm -hmm. um of of getting to to that point where they get to just start thinking about things and creating things? I mean, I don't know. That's kind of a roundabout question or like a really wordy question. Mm. But like, yeah, what what advice would you give filmmakers who are just starting out, yeah. actors who are just starting out, you know? Mm. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I would say that you don't work in a vacuum by any means. Like you, you are always going to be working with and relying on others. Um, so creating, I mean, just... Finding a team that you love 
is huge. My, I mean, my personal experience, I feel like I, I, I can't help but think that some of the most um, watershed moments of my life kind of happened in a blue sky kind of way. Like, like they just like came out of nowhere. Like, like I was on a path and I just like did a random opportunity or a random chance and it ended up shifting so much of, of what happened. Like getting into divine, to divine comedy is one of those things to me, um, meeting this group of people. Um, meeting the group of people that I eventually married one of them and, and like all of these yeah. different things that, that happened. Like, um, so I guess just being very open to new experiences mm. because you literally have no idea which path it's going to take you on. And then it's a very difficult thing and I'm not perfect at it by any means, but treating as many people along those paths well as you can, like, um, just never truly knowing like who is going to be able to give you an opportunity later or or even if they don't give you any sort of opportunity like what kind of impact you can have on other people's lives like you you definitely just trying to trying to live as um open to experience and as open heartedly as possible i feel like is the best advice I could give because I, I don't yeah it's at least the advice that I'm trying to give myself constantly <laughs> so <laughs> um, yeah as much as there are like difficult people or difficult things um injustices that happen resentments that arise like you you um you can really only control how you're how you're living your life and and how you can extend forgiveness and, and generosity to others. Um, and that generosity often just comes right back. So. Amen. Amen. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> that's definitely true. No, I think, and I think that's really, it's, it's not only is it good advice, it's good practical advice, mm -hmm. you know, it's so true. Th thank you for talking with thanks us for, today. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thanks for, this thanks for being really good. Thanks for being open to having me here. Yeah, I feel yeah. like I've learned a lot. I feel like I always do, though. I'm the lucky one. I'm still starting out as a mm. filmmaker, and so yeah. getting the opportunity to sit in a seat across from people who've been through the fire, the crucible, you <laughs> the know, <crucible. laughs> are willing to share with us our experiences. We really appreciate it. So. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't necessarily – it's weird because I know I said that it is a crucible, but at the same time it doesn't necessarily feel like <laughs> – there's any like significant experience that I've had or, or, um, it's just, it's just the fact that you're taking every day, yeah. one day at a time and just, and you're, you're ending up with opportunities that you make the best of whenever you can. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. We appreciate of course, it. Yeah. Thanks for listening. To find out who our next guest is and to stay up to date on all of our projects and announcements, follow us on all major social media platforms, at Soro Films. What makes this podcast distinct is that we put you, the audience, in the driver's seat. Influence the conversation by submitting questions for our guests ahead of each episode via Instagram. Soro Films helps in all aspects of the filmmaking process, including funding, production, marketing, and distribution, with a focus on emerging feature filmmakers. If you're developing a project you'd like to pitch to us, you can submit it at sorofilms.com forward slash submissions.